Father in heaven, as we look into your word, we lift our eyes and hearts up to you and ask that your Holy Spirit would fill us with the wisdom, with the knowledge, with the insights into your word that only your spirit can give. So thank you, Lord, for it. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you that we can call upon you in prayer because of what your son did for us in cleansing us from our sins. So bless this time and our fellowship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in the book of Ephesians. We're in chapter 4 now, and we're going to look at verse 7 today. And uh, I guess that's what you would call going through the Bible verse by verse, one verse at a time. Sometimes we take more than one verse. But uh, this morning we're talking about uh, spiritual gifts that have been given to the people of God. And you think about the whole church operating, each local church operating with people that have spiritual gifts. Have you ever taken a test for spiritual gifts to see which ones you have? In our elders class, we do that. And, um, and what we're going to learn today is everybody has a spiritual gift. Every believer has a spiritual gift, at least one that God wants us to use in the church. And all these individual people, all of us, we all have not only differing spiritual gifts, we also have different ways that we look. We have different backgrounds. We're different ages. We come from different cultures, whatever. But we all fit into a church, a body of Christ, a body of people, a unified whole. We're all together. And I, I try to picture this. Um, I can picture a company that I used to work at, a casino, and I worked there for some 18 years. And in this casino, a person would walk in and they would play a slot machine or they would go to a show or go to dinner or play 21 or whatever. Maybe the kids would go to the arcade. But behind the scenes, that casino had hundreds of workers to make that one person or that family that went in there enjoy it and, and have something good when they walked out of it. Of course, it's a casino, and they walked out, and they lost all their money. <laughs> like Ed uh, or Steve Wynn that owns the casinos in Las Vegas said, the only way to win at a casino is to own one. And I found out that's the truth. <laughs> yeah. But in this casino, uh, I worked for about nine years in security, and you had to have security because sometimes people got unruly. Sometimes people stole things from each other, and and sometimes uh, we had problems and uh, spilled food or spilled drink, and we had to take a report. You need people to do that. And when you walked through the door, you needed to have somebody that had cleaned the place, and you had people constantly cleaning it. And in the hotel, you had people cleaning the hotel rooms. You had people that worked at a front desk. So if you had experience of being a hotel clerk, you can get a job there. If you had experience as a plumber, you could get a job in the facilities department or electrician. They had a lot of electricians that worked there. They had um, their surveillance department up into the, in the ceiling, and it was in the ceiling. And you had to go upstairs to get there, uh, called the eye in the sky. And I used to go up there sometimes uh, to look at film of something dastardly that someone just had done or... Um, Sometimes, uh, for nine years, I also worked in the IT department, computers. We had to fix all their computers. As, as security and computers, I worked in, I, I had contact with every department. Uh, sometimes we had shows there. And uh, we had musicians, we had singers, we had dancers. Um, we had uh, all the people that worked, all the stage equipment, the sound crew and the, and the uh, audio crew and all that, and the sound booth there. We had to go up there and fix their stuff sometimes. They had a nightclub. We had to go fix uh, the cash registers when they wouldn't work. I used to program all the cash registers. They had beverage servers there. They had people that served food. They had some of the best chefs in Lake Tahoe there. Uh, excellent chefs in a five-star restaurant they had there. And all these different people. You had a whole ground crew that worked out keeping the, the grass all cut and the uh, snow all removed in the wintertime. And you had the, the general manager that uh, came there for a while, and he would cut the budget and then get a big bonus and leave. 
and then another one would come and have to put it all back together and then he would do the same thing. He had a ton of office workers there. At night, I'd have to go do something to all the computers in the main office. So there would just be maybe 30 computers in there. I just have to go from cubicle to cubicle, starting them all up and then running the program and then shutting them all down. Uh, when I worked on graveyard, we did all that stuff. So many different kind of people worked in that casino to make the whole thing work. So you had one casino with a thousand parts going on in that place. And when everything was working well, when you walked in, you would have a good time as long as you kept your winnings and left. And if you had a bad time, it's because some part wasn't working right. Somebody wasn't doing their job. In a church, God wants everybody to be doing their job so that everything works right. And we're looking at verse 7, but if you go down to verse 16 in chapter 4, you'll see the end of the whole church working right. Where does all this lead to? If you go down to verse 16, it says, uh, From Christ, the whole body, joined and held together by every joint which, which it is equipped with each part, is working when it's all working properly. He makes the body to grow so that it builds itself up in love. When everybody is using their spiritual gift in a local church, the church is maturing, the church is learning Bible doctrine so that when false teaching comes, we're not just following that. We're following and sticking to the Bible and the Bible, and the whole Bible and nothing but the Bible. When the church is nourishing one another, we're encouraging each other. We're lifting up each other. We bear each other's burdens. We confess our sins to one another. We pray with one another. We pray for one another. And when the whole body is working properly, the exact words, when the whole thing works, it's what God wants his church to be. And I'll say this at the beginning and I'll say it again at the end, that he wants his people to be in a church face to face. And in this past year and a half, a lot of people have learned, well, I don't have to go to church. I can stay home and watch it on my computer or phone or TV. And that's not what God wants. Hebrews 10, 25 says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together like some have the habit of doing. There are churches still closed. There were churches that were closed for a year. We were closed for one week, and that was it. When I sat at the table back there and, and did the sermon to put online on a website, and I had the big realization that the church wasn't here. This isn't the church. This is a building we meet in. The people weren't here. And I thought, I have to study this whole uh, attack upon this world and, and find out if it's really true. And I discovered that it wasn't. I found people that were telling the truth. So we met, we assembled together, we met face to face because God wants his church to be together. And then in uh, Hebrews 10, 25, it goes on to say, encourage one another and even more so that you see the day drawing near, the day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment upon this earth. And can we see it drawing near? Yes, we can. We can see what Bible prophecy says, and we can see the world not falling apart. We see it falling into place with each little piece of the puzzle all starting to really show up now. We can see it. And in this end time, God wants his people together. We're going to need to be together. So are we glad that... 2019 was over. Wow, let's get into 2020. Oh boy, are we glad that 2020's got over? Are we glad that 2021's going to get over? Hey, we're going to have 2022 coming up. Well, if you listen to what the globalists are saying, that's going to be the year we're going to transition over to taking over the whole world in 2023. Is that a conspiracy theory? Not if you go to their own websites and read it, because that's where we learn it. Is this coming year going to be worse? I think it will. Yeah. I don't want it to be. And I wish I could say, oh, we're, we're out of the woods now. No, we're not. Because the globalists 
I'll call them that. They have an agenda and they're following it. And right now they happen to be ahead of schedule when they were behind schedule for four years. But now they're ahead of schedule and they are pushing ahead and we can see it. In the Greek alphabet, there's an O and it's called Omicron. And it's coming to a city and a hospital and a TV station near you. And you know, I can guarantee that you won't be bothered by it if you do this one thing. If you turn off your TV and stop watching the news. If you do that, you won't be bothered by it. If you do that, we're going to be afraid. They make people afraid. Satan brings fear. Jesus was forever saying, don't be afraid. Sometimes he'd, he'd have to reach down and pick people up off the ground <laughs> that just fainted and, and say, don't be afraid. It's, it'll be okay. When the disciples were out in a boat that was swamping with water and they knew they were going to drown because they were most of them were fishermen, and Jesus would say, don't be afraid. And then he would say, peace be still. And immediately this water was flat. And immediately the, there was not a breath of wind. The exact moment that he said, peace be still. And his disciples looked at him and said, who is he? He's God. He makes water and waves and he makes the wind. And he can make them do whatever he wants. He just has to talk to them. Isn't that how God made the world? He said, let there be light. And there was light. He said, let there be a planet hung here in space on its axis with the moon and the stars and the sun, everything working perfectly. And it all happened as soon as he said it. He wants his church to be together, to meet all the way until the end. And we can. We can meet all the way until the end. Some countries are having it much harder. In China, uh, a Bible church is not allowed. You can have a state church, but the state church has to teach nothing but communist teaching, communist doctrine. doctrine. And they have people there monitoring that. But the, the real church of God is there. And there's millions of them. And they have to hide underneath the crawl spaces of their ho houses. And Bibles aren't allowed. But maybe some of them copied a Bible and has a sheet of, it's on a sheet of paper. And they all go into there and memorize it. Because that's all they have. And, and their pastor and his wife is not there because they're in prison. This is happening in China. And North Korea and Iran, where they just kill the Christians. Pakistan, where they frame the Christians. They'll go to a Pakistani believer who was newly saved. And they'll put a bunch of bad things about Allah and, and little flyers and tracks all over his lawn. And then they'll call the police up and the police go there. And, and they see all this bad talk about uh, Muhammad and everything and they turn him in and they arrest him and then they put him in a fake trial and then they put him to death. I watched a man uh, on a website that helps Pakistani believers get out of Pakistan and I watched this man give a testimony and he said I will not uh, go back on my following of Jesus Christ. I will never turn against him. My heart is committed to him and I fear for my family, my wife and children. And then he got done with his, with his talk. And then the next thing said, he was put to death a few days later. It's so sad what is happening in this world. We see the free country of Australia turn into a, a Nazi nightmare. And that's what they're experiencing right now. They've asked the whole world, please help us, because there's nothing we can do. And some of their own politicians are trying to speak out. Some of their police have quit and said, I can't do this anymore. No more judo throws to somebody on the ground because his mask was crooked. This is crazy. God wants Christians to meet together and be encouraging together. And we have to do this because he asks us. And isn't it good to be with other believers, with, with people that believe the same thing you do? And, and know that when you're talking to them, they're not thinking, what a nut. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> It's good to be with other believers, and we need to be. And as the day draws near, the day of judgment, the day of the coming of the tribulation period, we need to be together more than ever. 
more than ever. So um, think of the church a little bit like a, a casino with all the parts operating. Only we're the living body of Christ. We're not a business. Some people have said, I have books that say the church is a business. No, it's not. We're the living organism, the living body of Christ is what we are, who we are. And I'd rather think of a church like this. Um, my daughter plays the French horn, and she plays in symphonies in the Sacramento area and different places. And uh, she plays whatever chair, I don't know which, if she's first, second, third chair, whatever, but she plays a particular part, and she plays on her French horn, and then you have the trumpets and the trombones and the timpanis and uh, the violins and the flutes and the piccolos and the whole thing. And they're all playing the same thing, but, but they're all playing different. If you just heard a third chair, the third chair wouldn't be playing the, the tune, how it goes, the melody. Can you tell I'm not real musical? <laughs> okay. That's why I don't lead music. I only do it in an emergency when we need to vacate the building very quickly. People run when I sing. But all the parts, if you heard some of those parts, you would think, my goodness, that's, they're not even playing the same tune. They're playing off key. They're playing in harmony. And the whole group, when you hear the whole symphony together, they're all playing in harmony. And it all sounds incredibly beautiful. Some of the most lasting songs in the world were written in the 14, 15, 1600s with all of, you know, Beethoven and all those guys. Um, it, we still listen to their music because it's so beautiful. It's so incredible. And the church is like a symphony, all different parts, and we all together, we're harmonized. We're all fitting together, and it all sounds beautiful. One thing I like about sitting up here is that I can hear when everybody's singing, and it sounds good. I love to hear it. Yeah. So, as we look into the book of Ephesians, in this particular verse, we're going to divide this verse up into four parts, and we're going to learn how to use our spiritual gifts, how we, why we can use them, and what we're supposed to do with them, and, and how important it is to use them. And... Probably most Christians uh, don't know what their spiritual gift is. And it's something that we really need to know. I heard a, a preacher of um, one of these churches that have 20,000 people going to it in uh, something like six different campuses in the Sacramento area. He's, I heard one message by him. I wanted to see what he was preaching. And he said, when I went to seminary, he said, you know, all those years and all that learning, I only learned one thing. And that's all I remember is one thing. Well, I don't know what seminary he went to, but I remember a whole lot more than one thing. But I'm glad for the one thing he learned. He said, one professor told him one day when they were starting to teach about spiritual gifts, he said, that's what every believer needs to know. They need to find out what their spiritual gift is and do it and use it. For the, for the whole body of Christ, that we all work together in God's church. And he said, I've never forgotten that. And I've never forgotten that part of his message, and I don't remember any more about it. So that must be something pretty important, to find out what our spiritual gift is, and then let God use it, because it all comes from him, and he wants to use each one of us in a church. So we're going to break this up into four different parts. And the first one is how to use our spiritual gifts. Is we must be qualified to use spiritual gifts. You have to be a born-again believer to use them. Otherwise, you won't have them. And then second, we must be given our spiritual gifts. We don't earn them. We don't make them up ourselves. We're given them by God himself. And then third... We must be diligent. We must be very responsible to use them because we have been giving them. Each person has one, so use it. And then fourth, we need to be confident about our spiritual gifts because what God has given to us is exactly what we need to do what he wants us to do. If he wants me to get up here and preach every week, Instead of going to work in a casino like I did for 18 years, 
if he wants me to get up here and preach, he will give me exactly what I need to do it. And it will all come from him. So when someone says, wow, that was a great message, it does happen <laughs> sometimes. When someone says that, I think we'll thank God because the message came from God's word. The message came from the power of the Holy Spirit because I asked him, please, and give me boldness in the words to say to make your message clear. And it came from a spiritual gift that he's given with the ability to do this. So who really gets all the thanks? You can't thank me because I didn't do any of it. It's him that does it all. He really does do it all. So praise God. Thank him for his spiritual gift. So um, something that we need to think about too. In these last days, God gives each believer the exact gift that we need to deal with whatever comes our way and to accomplish whatever he wants our church to accomplish. In these days we're living, whatever comes our way and whatever comes this way, uh, what they're calling the dark winter um, and all the things that are kind of being promised to us, all of our container ships with millions of containers now sitting offshore and intentionally making it so they can't unload those things. Some of those ships are inspected and they have containers full of food, and if the food is rotten, they get fined. So it's cheaper for them to take that whole container of rotten food and dump it overboard, and that's what they're doing. They're dumping food that belongs to Americans overboard. All of what's going to happen in these last days, whatever it is, God has gifted us to be able to handle it, to be able to deal with it. And, he, and whatever he wants our church to accomplish in this community or around the world, he gives us exactly what we need. And we'll discover that as we look through this uh, verse. So in the context, uh, in chapter 4, 5, and 6 of Ephesians, that's the practical part. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. The first three chapters were all about, here's who you are in Christ. He's chosen you from before the foundation of the world. And he's chosen you to do good works. And you have an inheritance in heaven with him forever. And all of these wonderful things about our position. Now in chapters 4, 5, and 6, it's the practical part. Uh, I don't want you guys to be angry with each other. Stop it and now be kind to each other. Things like this. Uh, husbands, love your wives more than you love yourself. That's a hard one. All practical things. So now in this first part in chapter 4, these first six verses, he's saying the church is unity. We're all unified together. And in um, verse 3, he talks, he says we're to be eager to maintain this unity that he's given to us in Christ. We have to maintain it. And then he talks about in verse 4 about one body and one spirit and one hope, and one Lord, and one faith, and one baptism, and one God and Father, who is over all, and through all, and in all. And now he says, but grace was given to each one. In verse 6, it's talking about all people, the whole unified church. Now he's down to the individuals. He's moving from the whole down to the people. Each one of us. And in this context, where it says grace was given to each one of you. Now we're using, I use the English Standard Bible. It's similar to the New American Standard or the King James, or the New King James. It's called what they call literal translation because it's following the Greek order more literal than the, the NIV. Uh, it's just making it more easy to understand in English so it doesn't always follow it literally. But in the Greek, in verse 7, it's saying this. It says, each one. It says one. The very first word in verse 7 is one. And then the word but. And then the word each. So this word each is before everything. 
And that really strengthens each. That's the way Greek is. When it puts one of the words at the beginning of the sentence, it's saying grace was given to each one. It's emphasizing the each part, each of us. And then when it puts the word one in front of each, like it does, it's saying each one. We have to get this straight that God has given every one of us a spiritual gift. Each of us have one. And from these words, the way they're put together in Greek, this grace, and grace is like a spiritual gift. This spiritual gift was given to each of us. We all have it. We all have one. So being unified in a church, it doesn't mean uniformity. We're all the same. If you ever been to Shields uh, Sporting Palace, <laughs> call it, in, in Sparks, when you go look at the freshwater fish, well, I find them kind of drab and boring. If you look at the saltwater fish, oh my goodness, the colors and the shapes and the sizes and, and the ones that have to be in a school. And they just go around and around and the other ones that hide all by themselves in a little hole somewhere. And then all of a sudden you see them pop out and, and every kind of conceivable color and shape and the patterns and designs on them, they're all fish but they're not all the same. Uh, there's groups, uh, Heterites and Mennonites and Amish, and they all look the same. Well, they don't have to look the same because they're all different. God makes a unity through diversity. So, diversity is not a bad word. It was a good word until the world got a hold of it. But we're diverse. What we are is a church, all of the parts working together, we're a harmony that make one thing. And we talked about that a little bit already. Um, when I was a kid, my dad had a transistor radio that had a clear plastic cover. So you could see all the little transistors and diodes and the printed circuit on it. And you could see all that stuff. It was kind of neat. We've seen clocks that are clear. And you can see all the workings and little gears and everything going around together. When we start our cars to drive home, all the cars parts are all working together, lifters and pistons and rods and uh, all of this stuff. And then the transmission and the tires and the axles and bearings and everything's working together when we're just in a car going somewhere. Well, the whole church has all these parts and we're in harmony. Not uh, unity means, uh, not uniformity, it means harmony. And that's what the church is. So uh, first of all, uh, let's talk about this. In verse 7, we must be qualified to use our spiritual gifts. But grace was given to each one of us. So who are the us? Well, if you go to the first chapter of the book of Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, it says, To the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. They're saints. They're believers. They're born-again ones. They know the Lord. They belong to Christ. Because we believe that Jesus Christ is the one that paid for our sin. And we trust in him with our own sin. Lord, save me. I believe you're the, you're the one that God has sent to deliver me from my sin. It belongs to those that are qualified. And this particular word, grace, is how we're saved. What does grace mean? God's unmerited favor, we didn't merit it, we cannot earn it, is something that is given to us that we really don't deserve. After uh, living some years in sin of my own life, I was just overwhelmed one day the fact that God had still had grace to give me. And I, I just couldn't believe it. And I finally screamed out loud because I was walking on a golf course that was closed all by myself. And... I screamed out loud. I said, God, I don't deserve it. And I just, you know, I didn't hear a voice, but all I could think about, you're right. <laughs> you don't deserve my grace. You don't deserve to serve me in the ministry anymore. But I'm giving you what you don't deserve. It really makes you appreciate grace. He gives us what we don't deserve. And he'll never stop. He's so good. Grace. God's grace. So uh, believers, as believers, we have his grace. We're saved by grace. Um, Ephesians 2.8 says, By grace you have been saved through faith. 
in the book of Galatians, it, it makes it clear how important grace is. It's essential for salvation. In verse uh, 21 of chapter 2, it says, Paul says, I don't nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If we could earn our way to heaven without grace, then we nullify grace. We nullify it. It's not even necessary anymore. If we can do something to earn God's favor. We can't do anything to earn God's favor before we're saved. So we don't want to nullify the grace of God. We want it working. And if salvation were through keeping the law or doing something good, then it says Christ died for no purpose. Because why did he die? He died for sins to pay the price for our sins. And we can't pay the price for our own sins. You can, but it requires that you be in hell forever and can never get out. So we would rather have them paid by Christ than ourselves. So those that are saved, they're the ones that are given God's grace. And we live in this life by grace. So uh, 2 Timothy 1.9 says that God saved us and he called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So we're saved by something that we don't deserve, and that's the righteousness of Christ. And then we live by that too. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. We're not only saved by grace, we live by grace. Assuming that you have heard that the stewardship of God's grace was given to me for you. God gave Paul grace and it was called a stewardship, or he was responsible to preach God's word to the Gentiles, re responsible to show them this mystery of Christ, that there's now a church. He was responsible, and he said, God gave me his grace in order that I could do that. And in Galatians chapter 1, this is really, really shows it well. Uh, Paul didn't do a, enough good things in order to be saved, and in order for God to entrust him preaching the gospel. He was a Pharisee and apparently a very good one at that. He said, I, I was, you know, a heads above all my other companions. He talks about that in Philippians. But now in the book of Galatians, in chapter 1, verse 11, he says this, I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel was preached by me. It's not man's gospel. For I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ revealed the gospel to Paul. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. He's talking about his past. He said, I was a persecutor of the church. I was a bad man. And God didn't give me his grace to preach the gospel because of that. God said, by my grace, Paul, I will put you into the ministry because you don't deserve it. I will give it to you. I will give you a ministry. In verse 15 he says, But when he who had set me apart before I was born, who had called me by his grace. Before Paul was born, God knowing what he would do, that he would end up being a persecutor of the church, such a violent sinner, a murderer of Christians, a persecutor of Jesus Christ. Before he was born, God chose him and called him out to be one that would minister to the Gentiles, that would write all these books of the Bible. And he said, by his grace, Paul doesn't deserve it. And he never did. But only because of God's grace could he be a minister. Only because of God's grace can, can we minister for him and use our spiritual gifts. Because they're, they're actually called grace. There, there's, there's so much by grace 
in verse 7 of Ephesians uh, of chapter 4, that's what it's called. It's called grace. Grace was given to us. Spiritual gifts were given to us because we don't deserve them, but God wants us to use them. So we're saved by grace, and we do minister by grace. In Romans chapter 15, verse 15 and 16, uh, and there's many other scriptures. We're just looking at a few. Uh, in verse 14, uh, chapter 15, Paul says, I'm, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all the knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder. He's, he's, he's talking about the scripture that he's written. Because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. All this could happen because grace was given to me by God. That's why Paul could be a minister. That's why no matter our background, no matter the sin in our life today, God says, by his grace, we can use our spiritual gifts for him. And why don't most Christians do that? All we have to do is say, God, make me able to use my spiritual gifts in a church for you. Show me what they are and, and help me to get going. And God answers prayer and he will do that. Well, I don't know what, what they are. I think it's John MacArthur says, just start doing something. <laughs> and when you start doing it, you'll find out what it is. You don't need a test. <laughs> just start doing what comes natural. Because God has given us natural abilities. God has given my daughter the ability to play the French horn. He's given me the ability to turn a radio on <laughs> to play music. We all have different abilities that he gives us. And say, God, whatever my ability is, however you want to use me in this church, show me and, and you'll give me the strength to do it. Um, today it's very pop popular to listen to people online. And uh, especially Sunday when I go home, uh, I, I spend hours listening to sermons. And you know what? Some of them are over an hour long. And after one's done, I'll listen to another and then another and then another. And it's like uh, some of these sermons, when it's almost done, I think, no, no, you can't be done. You've got to say more. I want more. <laughs> um, we, we have this desire for the word of God and for the things of God. And we want to have God use us in his church today. So now that's the first thing. It's, it's all by grace, absolutely by grace. And now another thing is that we must be given spiritual gifts by God. He gives them to us. And um, if you have the notes on the left-hand side, I have the word give all the times in Ephesians. It's listed, and there's a whole bunch of them there. We won't read through all those. But God is a God that gives, and we're people that receive he gives us this gift of salvation and we receive it by faith. He gives us spiritual gifts and we can't make them up ourselves. So he has given us things. Uh, everything we have as a human being, God has given to us. One day I was, um, when I was walking in the mountains and weighed a lot less than I do now because I was walking in the mountains. You got to go up the hill and then down the hill. And you lose a lot of weight when you do that. But one day I was just praying, God, uh, just whatever you want to speak to me now, just speak to my heart and help me to really know what you're trying to say to me and what you want to say to me. And as I was walking, I, I was just looking at the ground. You always have to look on the ground because you don't want to step on one of those little lizards that hide under the dirt. And uh, you don't know what else. You know, it could be a snake. There are a lot of rattlesnakes and all this stuff. So you're watching the ground, and I begin to think the ground I'm walking on was given here by God. The very ground, the very earth, the very air that I'm breathing so hard. 
This air is given by God. We, we're a planet that has an atmosphere around it, that he's made it to stay that way. And he's made the earth to tilt a certain way. And, and the moon is the one making it do that. And the, the moon pulls the oceans. Not too much, just enough. Perfect. And when we go to the beach on a, on a day when it's 40, and I'm sitting there in the sunshine because there's no clouds, and the heat that's hitting my face and it feels so good, is 93 million miles away. <laughs> How does God do that? It's God that does that. He gives us everything. In the book of Acts, in chapter 17, 24 and 25, Paul is talking to these Greek philosophers, and he says to them, trying to tell them who the real God is, and he's trying to explain the real God won't fit in your little temple here. He's really big. <laughs> and he says to them, the God who made the world and everything in it being the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples made by man. And he is not served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. <laughs> he didn't want to make a list. He said, well, he gives us life and he gives us breath. And everything that he has. When you read in Genesis 1, he tells Adam and Eve, I have given to you every tree of the field that's good for food. And I've also given two trees here. You can take, take your choice. I'll tell you what will happen if you choose the wrong one. He gives to all mankind. He makes the rain fall on the good and the bad. Everything we have comes from him. And our spiritual gifts, likewise, they come from him. They're given to us. So wonderfully so. Uh, 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of the very grace of God. So he's given us his very grace. All of us have different gifts. He says we receive it because it's a gift and he gives it to us. And then Colossians 1.25 the church, Paul says, the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship which comes from God. The, the church was, the stewardship from God was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. So Paul is just again saying, the gift that I have comes from God. So it's a gift given by God to be used by him. God empowers us. And all of these gifts uh, that we have by, from God, they're all empowered by the Holy Spirit that he gives to us. And then God wants us to be diligent. He wants us to be, he wants us to use our gift. We'll put it that way. Uh, when he says the gifts are given to each one, that means every believer has a spiritual gift. And God intends for us to use the spiritual gifts. And that's the whole idea of the emphasis that he puts up on each one, each one of us does have a gift. And when you look at the scriptures, the different passages talking about spiritual gifts, uh, you realize that um, they are all a, a, a symphony of, of, peop, of talented people that God has made talented. In Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 3, Paul says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For in one body we have many members, and the, me the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many are one body, and individually members one of another, but we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who act, does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. He's telling the church, all you different people have different things to do. And whatever you do, just do it with all your heart. 
and do it with everything that God gives you to do. Because we each have something to do. And that verse in 1 Peter 4.10 is so good. As each has received a gift, each one of us have. Use it. Use the gift to serve God in the church. When uh, people aren't using their gifts in the church, the, the whole church hurts. The whole church uh, isn't what it should be. That's why it's so important for everybody to be involved. In the average church, something like 5% of the people are doing all the work. So if it's a church of 100, you know, five people are doing all the work. Is my math right? If it's a church that is uh, 20, <laughs> how many people are doing all the work? Hmm. It would be good if everybody were doing all the work and, and carrying all the load. So, uh, And this last point we want to look at is the fact that we need to be confident in the spiritual gifts that we have. And why we can be so confident in our spiritual gifts is because of who is giving them to us. The Bible says God gives them. It says the Holy Spirit gives them. And it says that Jesus Christ gives them. And in verse 7, our verse, it says, According, each one is to use his gift according to the measure of Christ's gift. Christ gives our gifts in a certain measure. And, and the word measure means to measure something. It's used in Revelation where John saw the temple, this 1,500-mile city being measured, and how thick the walls were. They're all being measured. Well, God gives to each one of us a certain amount of spiritual gift. Certain gifts, maybe one, two, three, four. And in each one of those, he gives us different measurements of it. Uh, one of the professors I had in uh, seminary, Homer Kent, Jr., wrote this in his commentary in Ephesians. He said, each person's grace, their gift, is in proportion to what Christ, in his sovereign wisdom, has freely given us. Not all receive the same gifts, or the same number of gifts, or the same amount of any one gift. Christ dispenses them as he thinks best. And in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, the chapter that's uh, one of the biggest chapters, the biggest chapter on spiritual gifts, it emphasizes that so much. God gives the gift for the edification of the whole body. And here we see that God gives a certain measure. He gives us a certain amount. So if God calls me to do something, he'll give me everything I need to do it. And I could be confident in that. Um, if God asks a believer, you know, I really want you to start doing this as a ministry, a lot of times a believer will say, I can't. Let's think of Moses. I want you to lead the people out of Egypt now. And he was thinking, been there, done that. I don't, I don't want to go back there. They're going to kill me. And I, I can't. And I stutter. And something's wrong with my mouth. And God says, well, I made your mouth. I think I can take care of that problem for you. And he said, no. And he finally said, why don't you get somebody else? And God got angry. And he was sensing that. And he said, okay, okay, let's do this. We'll, we'll do it. And, and God said, what's in your hand? He said, well, I got the staff. And he said, well, throw your stick on the ground. He throws his stick on the ground. It's a snake now. Didn't, well, not in his, pick it up and pick up the staff, the snake, and then it turns back into a staff. And the first time he went to Pharaoh, and he told Pharaoh to let his people go, and God told Moses to do something with his staff, and he did it. And a miracle happened because God did it. At that point, Moses started having confidence in God because he realized, it's not me, it's all God. Wow! And he went through all of the plagues, the, the flies and the, the everything, the frogs everywhere. He went through all this stuff and finally ended with the firstborn of everybody's family and animals dying, all of that. It's God, the power of God. I, I can do this. And that's what he wants us to know. He's given us a certain measure. Everything he wants us to do, we are able to do through the power of God. 
That's the key to the whole thing. One day, uh, a shoe salesman, many years ago, heard a story on the radio about a great preacher, great, one of the great evangelists in America. And that great preacher said, I have yet to see a man who has totally given himself to God. I would love to see that. And the shoe salesman heard that, and he thought, I want to be that man. I'm going to utterly give myself to God. So today, many of the books on my shelf are from Moody Bible Institute. They're from the Bible Institute in Chicago, Moody Bible Institute. R Moody went on preaching all over the world. Thousands of people came to Christ through his ministry because that shoe salesman, Moody, gave his heart to God utterly, and God worked through him in a mighty way. And the only difference between Moody and any of us is that our name isn't Moody. <laughs> we have our own name because God is the common denominator. It's God. When David went to face the giant, all the rest of the armies for days were scared to death of that man. And, and David showed up and he said, I'm not afraid of him. And Saul said, you're going to go after him? You better put on my armor. And, and he put on, you know, and it's like his arms are way up in the sleeves. I can't fight with this stuff. He says, God will deliver me. I went up against a lion, and I took the sheep away from that lion, and the lion went after me, and I killed the lion because God helped me. And the same with the bear, and this guy's no different. And it's interesting, it says, the paw of the lion, and the paw of the bear, and the hand of Goliath. <laughs> this big pawed guy is no different than any of them because God is with me. That's why. And God is with any of us, all of us. And he gives us a spiritual gift to be used in his church. And that's what he wants us to do in these last days, to use what God has given us, to be a church that God said, I am so pleased with you. You have held to my word. You have not departed. You have held to salvation through faith in Christ alone. You have held to that. You have not departed. And all of the world's teaching did not get into your church. You didn't shut down when they told you you had to. You stood for, stood for him, stood for God. And that's what we are to be, a church that is using our spiritual gifts because God gives us everything we need. What a challenge from one verse. So next week we'll continue on from there. But for right now, it's time to say, God, what spiritual gifts, what do you want me to do? I heard of a story And there was a church, and the pastors of this church, the elders, said, put out to the people, whatever is dear to you, I want you to give up for God. And people started bringing different things, money and, and possessions. And they said, you know, this has been so dear to me, I, I give it to you. And one lady brought him, them her cat, Meow, cat. <laughs> and they had the cat, and they said, what are, we, what are we supposed to do with this cat? Well, God was giving her a gift of, of her cat, and she said, uh, you know, I've been single all these years, and, and I'm old, and this is the most precious thing. It's my kitty, so I'm giving him to you. That's what you said. So they prayed about it, and one of them had this idea. Why don't we go to one of the nursing homes, and call upon all the people of the church to bring your pets and tell this nursing home, we'll bring our dogs and cats in to be petted by your people. Would you like that? And the nursing home said, that would be wonderful. And they started doing that. And that became the biggest ministry in their church. They, they were ministering to, to hospitals and schools and rest homes all over their city. Because one lady said, all I have is my cat. <laughs> God will take whatever we have to serve him and to say, God, just use whatever I have. Use me and help me to find the measure of the gift that you've given me. Let's pray together. So our Heavenly Father, we do pray that by your grace and your mercy, you will work in our hearts and challenge us. 
And most of all, Lord, encourage us that you want to use us, that you've given us everything we need to serve you, and that we can. Help us, Lord, to take that step to say, God, use me. I want to be used here in this body. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy that is abundant. Just challenge our hearts, we pray. In the name of Jesus, your Son, amen.